Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, it's great to see such a great crowd tonight. Um, just to hear Carol, Carol Stewart from the library, um, historian, uh, great storyteller, is going to talk about uh, Alfred Staples tonight. Thank you, everybody. Um, it's lovely to be here, and I want to thank Bruce in particular. Um, and the board of the uh, Collingwood and District Historical Society for allowing me to change my topic. Um, I had originally been supposed to uh, speak on the Payton Indians, and uh, I suddenly, well, I will explain it later, but something happened, and I suddenly found myself totally engrossed in the life of Alfred Staples. And I decided I wanted to change the topic that I was speaking about. And so here I am. Um, I think Alf Staples would be absolutely delighted to know that he could draw such a, uh, such a crowd so late in his life. I've had such fun preparing this talk for you, and I hope you will enjoy it as much as I enjoyed preparing it. Before I begin this evening, though, I need to acknowledge some help that I received from the many sources. First of all, um, I've already thanked the Historical Society for the invitation. Larry Pfaff of the uh, Art Gallery of, on, of Toronto uh, was very kind to provide some images um, of Owen Staples, who is a brother of Alfred, that I could use tonight. Uh, the Toronto Reference Library uh, gave me help in accessing the Canadian Homeboy, which is a book that I will be working on later with you. The City of Toronto Archives for information regarding the boy's home on George Street. University of Toronto for the digital archive that allowed me to download the Canadian <coughs> Homeboy online so that I could read it. Corrine, um, Live Corrine of the Ontario Archives of Mary Monk of the Library and Archives Canada regarding records on the home children. Sherry Christ of the Central Library, Rochester, Monroe County. Kim at the Vancouver Public Library. Kathy DeRuder and her family for very kindly allowing me to use images that Sondra Studio had taken of Alfred Staples. <coughs> Kathy Scott who is one of the board members for the Collingwood District Historical Society, for um, taking the time to introduce me to Sandra MacArthur, who is a great-granddaughter-in-law of Elf Staples, and she is here tonight, and is sitting beside a grandson of Elf Staples, which is, um, um, <laughs> my mind suddenly gone blank. Terry Osborne. Terry Osborne, Terry Osborne. And we spoke on the, uh, on the phone earlier this week. I've also been in touch with an Anthony Christ, who is the son of John Davies, or grandson of John Davy Staples, who is an older brother of Elf. And I spoke to Lauren Staples of Kinderly, Saskatchewan, who is also a grandson of Lauren Staples. So I've been trying to reach out in all directions, trying to get as much information as I can about this particular family. Oh, and I mustn't forget the most important people of all are the people who started this whole thing. And that is Janet and Michael Monahan. Without them, this wouldn't be happening tonight. And you'll find out shortly. Many of you who have grown up in Collingwood will certainly have heard of Al Staples, our man's <coughs> nature. Some of you have met him. Some of you have seen him running the streets. He was certainly a memorable character. I think many considered him a little eccentric, and for the period of time, I think he probably was. For most of his life, Alf spent his days sitting cross-legged on a bench, working at his job as a tailor. But he had always enjoyed being active, was, a great, was an avid gardener, and the gardens at his home, at the southwest corner of 3rd and Maple Streets, were universally admired. But once his children left home to pursue their own careers, he began to place more importance on his own lifestyle. In terms of his philosophy on physical fitness, he was a man well ahead of his time. I think this is a rather amusing picture. I love it. And I, I think it 
came from the uh, museum. It was in the newspaper, and I just scanned it and hoped it would be all right. <laughs> um, Alfred had always been a strong and, and strong and physically healthy, but now he made a routine of starting the day with a 10-mile jaunt, rain or shine, snow or sleet, followed by a cold bath or a dip in the lake. He never wore an overcoat in winter, and he certainly attracted attention with his ice water and snow baths. In 1933, at age 63, he undertook a hike to Chicago. He stopped briefly in Toronto to see the CNE and then continued his walk, which was in excess of 600 miles, completing it in 16 days averaging 40 miles a day, eating off the land, and turning down all lifts, all, all offers for lifts. He created quite a sensation upon his arrival in Chicago and was interviewed and photographed by the daily newspapers there. I tried to get some copies, but unfortunately, um, I, I just was unable to hire the person to do this research for me in such short time. At age 65, and he was examined by a Toronto physician who reported in the Toronto Star that apart from gray hair, Elf Staples could pass for a man of 40. His walks up the Blue Mountains piqued his interest in the area and enhanced his appreciation of the natural landscape and beauty around him. So in 1934, he purchased the property we know today as the Scenic Caves. Intrigued by the rock formations, he began to develop the site as a tourist attraction, giving names to some of the features that are still used today, such as Preacher's Pulpit, Fat Man's Misery, and the Ice Cave. He built himself a home there where he could stay during the summer months when the tourists flocked to the attraction. In 1948, his daughter Jessie and her husband Archie MacArthur purchased and carried on the business, as did their son Jerry and his wife Sandra at a later date, keeping the property in the family until the late 1980s. In 1980. How you eat, how you breathe, how you exercise and condition your mind, that is the whole secret he proclaimed. In the 1930s, this was considered very eccentric behavior, but today he would be considered quite admirable. He lived principally on vegetables, which he cooked <coughs> almost in their own moisture, so as not to lose the vitamins, seldom used salt, ate little meat or bread. He continued to work daily at his tailoring business and his daily 10-mile hikes until he was in his mid-80s. He died at age 91. And apart from a few miscellaneous bits of information, this is pretty well what we had in the library concerning Al Staples and his life until a month ago. <laughs> Since then, I have been on the most amazing trip. It has been, it, it began as a visit from Donna Mansfield, a former chair of the library board, requesting some help on behalf of a friend. He wanted information on an author, S.A. Francis, who wrote a book called The Canadian Homeboy. For some reason, he felt there was some connection with Collingwood. We did have records of a Fran uh, Samuel Francis in our index, our birth, marriage, and death index, but it didn't take me terribly long to determine that this gentleman was definitely not a homeboy, nor was he an author. I sent Donna an email message saying that I had done the search, showed her what I had done, but I was sorry I couldn't help her more. However, on the following Monday, I received an email from her friend, Michael Monaghan, with the following attachment. <coughs> A Canadian at home in the house of nature, Stanley Park, Vancouver, British Columbia. This tree is 66 feet in circumference. I just want you to know it's still there. I actually phoned the parks out there and they told me that yes, it is still there. They nearly lost it a few years ago and they had to work hard to save it. It's not a full tree, it's 35 feet of a stump. 
but it's still there. So that was an interesting picture. And this uh, was picked up by uh, Janet Monahan because her husband was at a, a postcard show in Toronto. And uh, he's very interested in collecting, he has been collecting postcards for years and years. And uh, he's very interested in, in postcards with trees on them. But then she turned it over and she saw there was a reference to Collingwood on the back. And so she bought the, bought the postcard and uh, that's what started this whole evening. Because this is what's on the back. It's a picture of a man of nature. There's reference to his walk to Chicago at age 63. And up in the corner it says, a souvenir of S.A. Francis, author of The Canadian Homeboy, an inspiring life story from 1881 to 1915, presented to His Majesty King George V and the Premier of Canada. But, under the picture, you'll notice that it says, over as he was in 1914. So the man standing under the main, that tree was Alf Staples in 1914, which was the time that this book was printed. And at the bottom, you'll see the signature, Mr. Staples, A. Francis. This was a pretty indi good indication that uh, the book was about Francis, about, about Alfred Staples. So, the Canadian homeboy. I searched the libraries for a copy of the Canadian homeboy, found that they had one at the Toronto Reference Library, phoned to see if I could interlibrary on the book and no, they wouldn't lend it out because it's too old. And, uh, but they did have it on, and, and it was in another section of the library, but they did have a copy of, some, of the book on microfiche in their section. So I asked them if they could go and see whether they could find out the name of the boy. I wanted to find out if this was indeed Alfred Francis um, Staples. So I was waiting back to hear from them. So I took the time and I looked up the obituary of Alfred uh, Staples to see what it would tell me. And on it, it gave me the name of his parents, Mr. and Mrs. Christopher Staples. I worked out his approximate birth date, searched the English records to see if I could find the family, because by now I was suspecting he was one of our British home children. Without difficulty, I found the family in the 1871 census, living in Newton, Abbott, Devonshire, a part of Plymouth. And here it is. Christopher L. Staples, that was Christopher Lucas Staples, age 42, retired farmer, born in Ilminster, Somerset. Francis E. Staple, 26, born in Totnes, Devon. David, John David Davy Staple, three. Sydney Staple, one. And Alfred Staple, six months, born in Newton, Abbott, Devon. In the usual, expectation of the British home children, I was expecting that something serious had perhaps happened to his father, Christopher. Why was he retired at the age of 42? That's very young for a farmer to retire. Was he seriously ill? So I looked up Christopher Staple on the 1881 census uh, for England, and he wasn't there. I, I wasn't surprised. I didn't expect that he would be. I, I, but I couldn't find his wife either, and I couldn't find the children in that Sort of surprised me a little bit that I couldn't find her. So I expected that he had died and that Mother Frances somehow had given the children into care. So now I thought I'll check the passenger list and see if I can find Alfred Staples listed as one of the home children coming over in a boat with like 40 other children. And I found him. But not as I expected. Here's the passenger list. The steamship Severn, bound for Quebec, left Plymouth in England on September 22nd, 1871, arriving in Canada October 8th, 1871. 
and it shows Christopher Staple, age 42, gentleman, gentleman, not a laborer, a gentleman. Wife Fanny, age 29, Bessie, age 11, Rose, age 6, Owen, age 5, John, age 3, Sidney, age 2, and Alfred listed as an infant. <coughs> Whoa, there are a lot more children here than there were shown on the 1871 census. So, the first thing I noticed was there was quite an age difference between Christopher at 42 and Fanny at age 29. So I went back to the 1861 census and then found that Christopher had been indeed married before to a Charlotte Hillman Hopkins and had three children by her. At that time, Christopher owned a farm of 130 acres, employing 35 boys and six men. This is su suggests that he was a market gardener. And he also had two servants, a house servant and a housemaid, and a nursemaid. So for that time period, he was quite well off. So to paraphrase, paraphrase events quickly, Charlotte died in the early months of 1863, and in the summer of 1864, Christopher married Frances Fanny Emily Davy, and over the succeeding years, they had five children, Rosa Mary, Owen, John, Sidney, all born in Somerset, and Alfred and Devon, prior to sailing for Canada. So now we know that the family safely emigrated from England in 1871. So where were they in the 1881 census? Well, I couldn't find Christopher, or Fanny, or Francis. So I tried Alfred, and here's what I found. In the 1881 census for St. Thomas Ward in Toronto, this was a boy's home. And you can see there all the children. There were actually 102 of them. I counted. And the ones that I've starred there are Sydney Staple, age 11, Alfred Staple, age 10, and two pages over, I found two more staple boys. I didn't know whether they were related, but I suspected that they might be. Joseph, age seven, and Charles, age six. They would have been born in Canada. Were Joseph and Charles brothers of Alfred and Sid? I, I suspected so. In the meantime, I received an email from Tanya Henley at the Toronto Reference Library. They checked a couple of the pages of the book and they couldn't find a name for the child. However, they did let me know that the book was available as a free download on the internet. So I downloaded the book, and I spent the two ne next two nights reading it. <laughs> and it appeared to be the Alfred Staple story, but lightly disguised. But what a find! It's a personal memoir, and far more intriguing, because it was blind written. Now, it was blind written because at the time that this book was published, the people that were mentioned in the book were all alive. And some of them may not have wanted it out that this was their story and these were the people in the book. So it became a blind book. And in the downloaded copy, if you open up on the first thing, it, there's a question mark in pencil written on it says, is he a Canadian, is he Canadian or British? Question mark. Um, they presumed British because it was printed in England, the book. So, having read the book, I, I started to verify some of the facts, and I started to realize that this was indeed Alfred Staple's story. Alfred goes by the name Francis, that was his middle name. Duntroon is called Dunstown. Nottawa is Hopeville. Collingwood, the terminus. But his brother Sid remained Sid, and his brother Lauren remained Lauren. But interestingly enough, his brother Owen had been changed to Henry. The tailor, Donald Smith, is known as Andrew Hardy. <coughs> so bear, please bear in mind that this story begins in 1881, and life at that time is quite different from the world today. The people in the small community were well known to each other and most of them related to each other in some way. 
and someone new was always considered to be an outsider. Society at that time was also more class-oriented. Well-to-do families often had servants, and what you do and how successful you are defines your status in life. Taylor Donald Smith, age 46, was a very successful, had a very successful and busy tailor shop with many employees. But he also had considerable property with fruit trees, vegetable gardens, cattle, hogs, sheep, chicken, and doves. He and his wife, Flora Blair Smith, had five children when Alfred arrived. Mary was 11, one year older than Alfred. Then came Flora, eight, Peter, seven, Donald, uh, three, and baby William. Two more children would follow while Alfred was living with the family. This was a period in history before indoor plumbing, when water had to be brought in by the bucket for cooking and laundry. There was no central heating. The wood had to be chopped and carried into the house for cooking and heating. Plus, the livestock needed to be fed, the gardens hoed, the fruit picked and dried. Taylor Smith could hardly do all this himself with his successful business. And I have no doubt that this was the reason they decided to adopt a homeboy. So, with Alfred in mind, let me read the opening of the book. I have used the real name so as not to confuse everybody. And I've also cut pieces to shorten it a little bit. Although my earliest recollections only go back to Canada, I was born in England, my family coming from a little town in Devonshire. They belonged to the middle class and were in good circumstances. My mother was a woman of refinement and well-educated. My father came of good stock and lived on his income. It is true that the income was not large, but it was sufficient to keep the family in comfort. My father was ambitious to provide a nice fortune, not only for himself and his wife, but for Pardon me? but for his children. And the thought of emigrating to Canada, a country which was looming large in the public eye, came to mind. After discussing the matter with his wife, it was decided that they would sell all their possessions and move to the new country. They made their new home in Toronto. This is not exactly true. They made it in Hamilton. They came to Toronto later. And here the family lived in comfort for several months. My father, however, was disappointed with his new home and the new condition of things. He made several investments, but each investment, each investment proved a failure. His last venture cost him 500 pounds. That would have been $2,000 in 1870. That was a lot of money. And every cent was lost in less than four months. His misfortune so discouraged him that he took to heavy drinking in order to forget his misery. This brought the family to want and poverty. The children began to clamor for food and clothes, which became scarce and shabby. Owen, the oldest boy, tried to keep the wolf from the door by selling papers and running messages. There were eight children in all, most of them too young to help in making a home. Mother opened a little school to teach boys and girls reading, writing, and music. By this means, she managed to keep the family together for a short while, but the burden was too heavy. She collapsed and became very ill. A Christian lady who became very interested in the family used her influence to get three of the youngest boys taken into the boys' home of Toronto. I was only about four years old at the time. I never knew my father, and I have but a faint recollection of my mother. In actual fact, at least five boys were, were put into the boys' home. Four as shown in the census of 1881 for Toronto, which we saw earlier. And I also suspect Owen was placed in the home as well because he was one of the brothers that saw him off before he left for Duntroon. Owen in 1881 was apprenticed as a young blacksmith and is living in Toronto with a blacksmith's wife and young child. John, the next child after Owen, appears to be living in Quebec City where he is listed as a servant in an English-speaking household. Lauren, the youngest child, is to be found in the boys' home in 1891, 10 years later, at the age of 13, probably having lived his whole life there. It would appear 
that their father Christopher abandoned the family in Toronto about 1877, as he does not appear in the Toronto Directory after that period. But he does show up back in his hometown in Somerset, England, in the 1891 census. So he just took off and went back to England. <laughs> Fortunately, though, he's working as a laborer there. He's no longer the landowner. And he died in Wiltshire about three years later. I found, uh, I found Christopher census, uh, Christopher uh, Stable. The name at that point was Stable. There was no S on the end. It was changed with all the children. He, um, he was living in Hamilton. Apparently they settled in Hamilton to begin with. And I found him there in the, <clears throat> in the 1874, 1875, 1876 uh, directories for the, for the town of Hamilton, or the city of Hamilton. <clears throat> and he was working as a gardener. And then in 1876, the same year, he also shows up in the Toronto Directory as a porter. And the following year, in 1877, he shows up in the Directory as a gardener again. And then he vanishes. And I, that is when I think the boys went into home, home care. So what was the Toronto's home? The Directory for the City of Toronto describes the, bo the boys' home. This institution is designed to furnish a home for destitute boys not convicted of crime. Number of inmates, 90. I counted 102, but we're close. So to continue with Alfred's account. About the time I am writing, there were some 90 boys in the institution. The officers consisted of a matron, a teacher, a cook, and two or three general helps. The boys were taught to assist in every department the cooking, the cleaning, the sewing, the gardening, etc. Three meals a day were given to the children. The breakfast consisted of porridge, bread, and milk. Dinner was soup, potatoes, sometimes meat, and the supper was usually bread, butter, and fruit. I have nothing but praise for the home. Even today, I thank God for it. It gave me shelter, food, and clothing, and introduced me to the Christian gentleman who adopted me. The home implanted in me Christian principles of sobriety and chastity. I spent four happy years at the boys' home. I was fatherless, and as far as my little experience went, motherless. A few days before leaving the home, my mother had been told that I would have to leave the institution to be apprenticed to a tailor in a country town 90 miles from Toronto. Upon hearing this, she went to the home with a little present for me. Somehow, however, as I had been in the home since I was four years of age, I had no fili filial feeling, and the little something mother had brought did not appeal to me. This apparent ingratitude and lack of appreci appreciation on the part of her little boy vexed my poor mother exceedingly, and she departed in tears. I never saw her again. Before leaving, I was requested to go and select a new suit for myself. The suit I was to travel in and to wear to my new home. I chose a knickerbocker suit and buckled shoes. In my new clothes, I thought I was very smart indeed. I was allowed a day off before leaving. This day I spent with my two brothers, Owen and Sid at Hanlon's Island. Owen had already shown the best of his mind, for he loved drawing, and today is a famous artist, and we'll talk about that later. He made a little sketch of myself and duly presented this to me as a token of affection. Sid gave me a little storybook. This storybook and the Bible which was presented to me by the home authorities were the only two books in my possession in those days, and they are the books which I value most now, for I have kept them all these years in my new home. It was May 1881 when I arrived at Duntroon. It was a farming community and the majority of the residents were well fixed, as they say in Canada. Donald Smith, the gentleman who adopted me, was a tailor by trade, in good circumstances, honest and reliable, and well liked in the neighborhood. He was also irascible in temper and would growl frequently and unnecessarily. His wife was a good Christian woman, I 
kind mother and much respected. The old gentleman and lady had children of their own, some of them my own age. But the old man wanted an apprentice on cheap terms, so he decided to adopt me. The articles of agreement between Donald Smith and the boy's home called for him to protect the boy, treat him kindly, teach him the trade of tailor, and to be responsible for him until he was 18 years of age. He was also to pay the home $15 per annum, a deposit, which was to be kept in the home's treasury until the boy became 18, when the money would be paid over to him to form a little capital with which he could start his life. I had only seen the old gentleman once, but upon alighting from the train, I immediately recognized him and rushed into the old man's arms. Just pretend that the cars are horse and buggies. <laughs> On our way up to the house, I saw a cow which had a bell hung to its neck, and not having seen such an object before, I was highly amused. Donald Smith's house was full of visitors, curious to see Donald's new boy. Some of them thought he was cute. Others thought he was a bright looking young fellow. And others decided, he'll do. <laughs> At nine, I was told to retire to bed. Here, everything was so new and strange. I had to go to sleep in blankets while I had been accustomed to sheets. This was a new experience and I broke down. Tears began to flow over my cheeks and I felt as if my heart was breaking. I was only 10 and a stranger in a strange land. One big friend I made the next morning was a ta lady tailoress, Miss Mary Dallas. She was a maiden lady of about 30, of medium height, dark hair, and hazel eyes. She decided to be kind of a second mother to me. And today I want to acknowledge that I owe much to the good that is in me, to the kindness and Christian sympathy of this lady. The following day I had to go to school, but I soon found that I was not treated like other children. Even the boys and girls pointed to me as the boy from the home. The children did not want to play with me. The teacher thought that I deserved less attention than the others. It was not long before I began to realize that I was in a class altogether different from everybody else. This feeling became stronger and stronger until I found it almost impossible to associate with others. I grew to love loneliness and isolation. The work of the Smith home was piled on my shoulders. I had a dozen or more things to do every morning before going to school. The consequence was that it, was, it became too late for me to get to school promptly, about every third or fourth day. This kept me back in my lessons, and gradually I grew to hate school, although I was still ambitious to get on. Now, this is the Presbyterian Church at Duntroon. Uh, Taylor Smith's house was located immediately to, the, uh, to our right of this. And actually his house wasn't there, his shop was on the street, and it, it later became a bank and was torn down in 1961. The house apparently is still there, further back. There's a street in there now that wasn't there then, um, and that would have all been um, Taylor Smith's property. It was galling, however, the way I was discriminated against at home. Smith's boys used to go to church in nice Sunday clothes, but I had to go to church in my everyday smock and rough pants. It is not surprising that one Sunday found me peevish and sour and ready to fight with Smith's own boys. The eldest boy was a little bigger than I and a spoiled child. He was never asked to do anything around the house. When he ordered me to go and fetch a pail of water from the well, I told him to do it for himself. After all, he was stronger than me. When he told me I was a nobody, just a slave, I struck him with all my might. The noise brought Mr. Smith and I was censured, given a good shaking, and as further punishment had to go without my dinner that day. That would have been easy punishment compared to what happened in other places. As I grew bigger, I became the errand boy, the wood boy, the chores boy the gardener, 
So it is not surprising that I developed a good, healthy, and strong body. I was able to do a man's work before I was 16 years of age. Among my favorite occupations was gardening. It was a joy to me. Next to this, I liked attending to the pet animals. Even the calves and sheep used to run to me and rub around my legs. After the duties of the day were done, I had to go into the tailor shop and learn the trade and learn to sew. This task was very arduous at first. One man would tell me to do a thing one way, and then another person would tell me to do it another way. This puzzled me, and Smith would frequently lose his temper and call me names. The lady tailors, however, were very kind to me. Mary took special patience with me, and slowly I began, became able to make a pair of pants. When the job was creditably finished, my pride in my achievement was so great that I went and I had my photo taken. <laughs> After many years in Duntroon, Alfred received a letter from Sid, one of his brothers. Sid was now a manager of a big store in Morrisburg, um, and he was coming to Collingwood on a tour boat. Sid, uh, Alfred continues. He asked me to meet him at the pier. Old Smith did not like the idea of relatives writing to an adopted son and coming around to visit him. He thought it would spoil my usefulness and ultimately alienate me from him. After considerable cogitation, permission was granted. And in high glee, I made for the lake. The excursion boat had already arrived and the excursionists had wended their way into town. Finally, I saw someone who resembled a family. Seven years had passed over our lives since we had met, and there was something in his countenance that revealed the family mark. Going up to him, I asked if he were not Sid. Sure, he replied, and we clasped each other in the most affectionate manner. It was a cup of joy to my parched lip and a brimful of happiness. The memory has lasted many a long year. Well, Obviously, I can't read the whole book. <laughs> Suffice it to say that Alfred finished his period of apprenticeship, and then he went out west, had some very interesting experiences, but managed to lose all his capital. And he had to um, write to Taylor Smith and ask him if he could send him his fare so he could get home. Needless to say, this confirmed everyone's opinion about homeboys coming to no good. However, after a few years, Alfred left Duntroon and set himself up in a tailor shop in Nottawa. My business was growing and swelling in volume every week. I seldom heard the obnoxious name, Homeboy. The elite of Nottawa visited my store and gave me orders. Even the minister patronized my store. As the little stream kept swelling and swelling, I decided to buy the store next door to mine a general merchandise business. Instead of one window facing the main street, I now had two windows and a nice little stock. Now, when Alfred was a boy, he had occasion to accompany Taylor Smith to a friend's home near Nottawa to deliver a cow that he had traded. As Alfred waited at the gate, he saw some ladies on the veranda of the house making a fuss over a lovely little girl who he learned was living there with her aunt and uncle. He envied the little girl the love she was being shown. At that moment, he fell just a little bit in love with her. But now, years later, he was living in Ottawa and had occasion to give her a lift into town. And he recalls. After beating about her home for several months, I, one Saturday evening, put my fortune to the test. I caught the girl's hand, pressed it, and looked into her eyes, and I asked the inevitable question. She thought, bowed her head, blushed, and whispered something. As the old people and the brother were by no means any too favorable to the match, we, the young couple, decided to run over to Tantroon to the minister there to tie the knot. <laughs> she was 21, and I was 22. Well, he's out a year in their ages. 
but that's from the that's from the register. And they were married in the manse at Ventrude. Kate Connolly, Kate Wilson Connolly, it's called the Wilson Farm, where they were living in the book, but it was actually the McAllisters. But the interesting thing here is Elf's parents' names. I don't think he knew his father's name. I've been trying to figure out what it says here. It looks like fancier. But his name was Christopher, so and it certainly doesn't look like Christopher. And F, so I don't think he really knew at that time the name of his parents. After the wedding in 1895, Alfred moved into the McAllister home near Nottawa where Kate had grown up. Her aunt and uncle continued living there with them. For four years, the old people lived with us under the roof of the little boy who had stood outside the gate for several for hours several years before. I had certainly treated the uncle and the aunt well. These were years of prosperity and success. The sun shone on the little home and the business all, all the time. <coughs> now this is the church at Nottawa. Um, and he is supposed to have been um, instrumental in founding this church. It opened in 1895. <coughs> And, an, and according to the book Lex Reminis, Alfred Staples was founder, one of the first managers of the church. And as Alfred noted in the book, I was elected an elder and a superintendent of the Sunday school. But more importantly for Alfred was the reunion with some of his own family. My relatives found my home a common rendezvous. My sister, who I had never seen before, came to visit me. My youngest brother, Lauren, whom also I had never met, came to make his home with me. The successful brother, Owen, visited me, and Sid was often there as well. So this is Lauren Staple, Alfred's younger brother, taken not far off the time. And his, Lauren's son wrote a family history out in Kindersley, Saskatchewan, where he eventually settled. And he said, Dad, Lauren Staples was born and raised in Toronto, Ontario. And my mother, Barbara Hahn, or er, yeah, my mother, Barbara Hahn, was born and raised in Ottawa, a distance of about 100 miles. Dad's older brother, Al Stainful, had a general store in Ottawa. My, mother fa my mother's family, the Hahns, of which there were six boys and five girls, lived near the mill pond a short way from my uncle's store. Through Dad's, through Dad's visiting and helping my uncle in the store, he came to meet the Hans. After work, he loved to go to the Han farm and have a game of football with the boys. Because Dad had to go to work in Toronto as a typesetter for, the Toronto, for a Toronto newspaper, their courtship lasted for five years. But on November 1903, they were united in marriage and began their lives together in Toronto. They were married in the same church that Alfred and Catherine had been married in eight years before at Duntroon. Alfred continues, this home we enjoyed together for several years. Providence smiled on us. Business was successful. <clears throat> I grew in favor in the town and in the church. Kate and Esther passed away, leaving the home to Kate and her uncle Robert. When her uncle Robert died, Alfred and Kate sold the property and moved to Collingwood, where Alfred set up a tailoring business and made their home on Cedar Street. Three children were born to us, and then came the great calamity that once again sent me friendless into the wilderness. My wife was weak, and one Sunday morning, three days after the birth of, her th of our third child, she called me to her bedside. Her face was like an angel but oh, so frail. Clasping my hands in her, she whispered, don't cry, it's all for the best. God moves in, the, in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. Now it was all over, and sorrow numbed my heart. Following the death of his young wife, Alfred was lost. He was being crippled by expenses incurred with his wife's illness, 
and his business in Collingwood was tailing off. A housekeeper was found to help care for the children, but this too was adding to an ever-increasing debt. The Canadian West at the time was expanding at a terrific rate beyond the prairies. Towns were sprouting up everywhere and fortunes were being made. Alfred struggled with his failing business for another three years, and it wasn't until after his marriage to Minnie Kenbar in Toronto that Alfred was able to take steps to leave Ontario for British Columbia. Now, I'm going to leave you to read the book. <laughs> And I was very fortunate. I was able to purchase um, two copies through Amazon, if you can believe it. Um, one of them came from uh, Regina, which I thought was sort of interesting. And inside, it's inscribed, To my dear friend, to Mrs. M. Blair, that would have been Malcolm Blair, from, and then there's a dot. I think he was debating whether to sign his real name, and then he just puts the author. <laughs> Still not gonna give away a secret. And this picture is attached inside the book. The introduction of the book notes that the author has a simple yet ambitious purpose in writing this book. A man of essential modesty, he has no desire to put his inner life before the world. But he is possessed of a consuming passion to benefit just that class of boy to which he was attached. And the profits from the sale of the book shall be devoted to this worthy object. I should have read something a little earlier. I, didn't, I, I should finish off the story a little bit for you. Um, Alfred, when he went out to Vancouver, succeeded in a very big way and in a very short period of time, just four years. He, he continued to do his um, tailoring business during the day, but in the evenings he got into real estate. And I'll, uh, I'm going to let you read that part yourself, but he did very well for himself. And this left him the opportunity of something that he felt very passionate about, which was to write this book. And in November 1913, he sailed on the SS Escandia for Plymouth, England, not returning until March of 1914. And I feel confident that he returned with the first edition of the Canadian Homeboy in his pocket. So, to continue about the author's purpose of writing the book. Now that he has achieved a moderate degree of substance and good, pos good position, our author feels strongly that it should be his life work to establish some kind of institution in Canada that shall take the needy and deserving boy and thoroughly equip him for life. The author's idea is that this shall be a place with which the stigma of charity will not be associated, where the boys will be taught not only the three R's, but also useful arts and crafts. He proposes to abolish the word home altogether in connection with the institution. For people use it too frequently, often thoughtlessly, in such a way as to cast a slur on the boy raised and educated therein. He proposes to call such an institution the boys' college, so that in afterlife, the boy will speak of the college of his adoption. It is estimated that 100,000 pounds, $500,000, at least will be required to establish the college. The author is contributing all his wealth towards this end, and the balance of his life will be devoted to this object. This, ladies and gentlemen, is how I think Alfred Staple should be remembered. Now, would you like me to um, I've got some reflections here where I was going to talk a little bit about his family. Um, do you feel we have time to do that? Yes. Would you like me to just do that? Yeah. All right. So what happened to the rest of Alfred's family? Well, Owen Staples, the brother who um, 
was the artist, turned out to be one of the most amazing artists in Ontario. Seven of his paintings hang in the City Hall in Toronto. Um, his paintings are part of the, uh, I think it's Ross, Ross Robertson collection. He did a, a series of historical paintings. Um, he was a political cartoonist historical painter, musician, and naturalist. He, he sang for uh, 40 years with the Mendelssohn Choir. And Alfred also was a very good singer from what I've read in the book. He worked for the Toronto Telegram for many years, and he was a good friend, strangely enough, of Kate's brother, who was Colonel John A. Curry. Um, they shared the same mother, they had different fathers. But uh, they both worked at the Telegram together because Colonel Curry at that time was a journalist with the Telegram. And it's also interestingly enough where Lauren Staples years later apprenticed as a typesetter. Here are some, this is a picture of um, Owen Staples at work in the Don Valley. I actually think I know where that is because I used to go up through the Don Valley to go riding when I was little. This is a picture <laughs> that the, um, the Ontario Art Gallery scanned for me, but they didn't use a very high resolution, so it's hard to see. But that's called Inglenook. It's a fireplace that was in, um, his, in his home. He built a house out of um, bricks from the Don Valley Brickworks. He used cast-offs. And his house today is 69 Hogarth Avenue in Toronto, and it is open to the public. It's, it's a memorial to uh, Owen Staples. And that's one of his Impressionist paintings. So he was quite an amazing artist. Now, Bessie was the first one that was on that, the first of the children that was listed on the, um, on the passenger list coming to Canada. Now, Bessie would have been the daughter of Christopher and his first wife. And her name was Harriet Elizabeth. Um, but she was called Bessie, and I presume that from that she was called Elizabeth. As far as I can make out, um, I found a marriage of a, an Elizabeth Staple um, in, on January 16, 1880, listing her father as Christopher Staple, but her mother is Jane. Now, her mother wasn't Jane, her mother was Charlotte, but she would have been so small when her mother died, I don't know if she really knew what her mother's name was. So, that could be her marriage. I can't find any other reference to her anywhere. Now, Rose, her actual official name is Rosa Mary Staple. Um, there was a story that came through Owen Staples that um, he said that they had lived in Hamilton and that after the father deserted the family, they immediately moved to Rochester, where his mother died in 1881, Rochester, New York. Um, but I know that Owen Staples, Staple was, was in Toronto in the 1881 census. I don't think he wanted people to know about his past because he had huge open houses at his house and all the top people in Toronto frequented his house and I don't think he wanted um, anybody to know about that part of his background. But he did study in Rochester later on and, and he did, um, but there are conflicting things because he also got some of his things in Toronto at an earlier date. So there's kind of a little dichotomy there. But I followed up on the Rochester angle of it and um, searched in Rochester. I got the uh, librarian there to check the directories and we found that um, I couldn't find them in 1881 or 1882, but in 1883, Fanny Staples, Frances Staples, is listed as a widow of Christopher <laughs> living in Rochester. And that would have been her. And she only shows up the once. And you wonder why, why did, why did she go to Rochester? Like what, when she had her other children in a home in Toronto, why would she suddenly take off to Rochester? Well, Alfred refers to his mother becoming very ill, and I suspect that she um, had TB. She, um, there was a huge sanatorium in Rochester, which was world famous. It, the main buildings that we know of today hadn't been built yet, but I still think that there was a sanatorium there at that time. And I think she may have gone to try and get a cure. It's a guess. But it's, I, and I found um, a death for 
uh, or a burial in uh, Mount Hope Cemetery in Rochester for a Francis Staple. Um, Francis is spelled the ma masculine way with an I, and I'm, I'm hoping, I, I think it's probably an error. Uh, the age of the person was 36, um, died of tuberculosis consumption, as it was called then. Um, was born in England. So a lot of the facts fit. A couple of years out on the age, but she, she, I don't think she was quite yet 40. So it would make sense that that might be her. And it's the only uh, burial I could find for Francis Staple. There was another one not far from Rochester, but she lived to 1930, but she wasn't born until, well, she would have been 10 when her children were born, so it couldn't have been her. <laughs> <coughs> um, so Mary uh, Rose um, Staple actually came and got married in Ontario. She was married in Niagara Falls to a William Stone Woodsworth in August of 1883. Um, the death of Fanny was in, I think, April of 1883, so a few months after her mother died. She was 18, a resident of Rochester. He was 36, twice her age. And as best as I can make out, he was a bigamist, if not a trigamist. <laughs> <laughs> if there is such a thing. Um, his first wife was alive and well with a young daughter. Um, and she still lists herself as um, being married in the next census. And she continues there as well. Um, and then I found he got married, well he married her as the second wife. I found out he married a third wife. Um, and on the 1921 census, he was 80 years old. And he moved to Virginia at this point. He's got a 36 year old wife. <laughs> and he's a preacher man. He's got his own church. Um, and interestingly enough, his first wife um, was a, a Christian science lecturer. So a little bizarre connection there, which made me laugh. It brings a little lightness into your life. Um, John Davy Stable. Um, when I was searching information on Owen, um, I found a, a note on um, the historical plaque for his house in Toronto, which allows, has a little blog on it. And there was somebody there who said that he was the grandson of um, John Davy Stable. So I quickly made contact with him. And his name is Anthony Christ. And he doesn't know anything about the early years of his grandfather either. His father uh, married a French-Canadian lady, which sort of fits with the French-Canadian connection. And, um, but they finally settled in Kansas, Missouri where they adopted a little girl when they were older. Um, but uh, I, I, I want to get in touch with him and see if he can find an obituary that might give any further information. And next we have Sid. Sid who kept dropping in. Sid who he met at the end of the pier. Um, well, of all the children, Sid was the one I think who fell through the cracks. Um, I found him in 1921, he's a beachcomber on the, uh, up in Sault Ste. Marie, Algoma. And he died in 1930, October 27th, 1930, of acute nephritis in a house of refuge, which I thought was very sad. Now, Joseph Staples and Charles, the other two that appeared in the 1881 census. Um, the next time I found them, they're in Rochester too. I think everybody's flocking to Rochester because I think they heard mother had gone there and I think they're all trying to find her. Um, they're living near Rochester in 1892. They're living together and they're both listed as upholsterers and listed that they were born in Canada. That's the last time they claim any connection to Canada. In every census after that they say, oh no, we were born in the States. Um, and. Uh, Charles, did, Charles married and had, um, had a family, and they were living in Rochester, New York, um, at the time when John Davy Staple died. I got this from his obituary. Um, and Charles married as well. And he had a farm, and uh, he had a child. It was actually his wife's child from his first marriage. And he was a farmer in Fayetteville, New York, which is um, near Rochester. And then, of course, we come to, to Lauren. 
Now, Lauren um, obviously grew up his whole childhood in the boys' home in Toronto. And it was interesting because I've spoken to Lauren Staple out in uh, Canusley, Saskatchewan, his grandson, his namesake. And uh, I said, did you know that your, your grandfather was a, a homeboy? And he said, what's a homeboy? <laughs> <laughs> so I explained to him what a homeboy was, and he said, no, but he said, I wish my father was alive. His father died at age 94, just last December. Oh. And he said, I wish my father, I wish my father was alive so he could have spoken to you um, because he was so interested in his family. Um, so we've been commuting back and forth. Um, his father, his uh, Lauren, um, worked as a typesetter at the Telegram. And then after he got married to Barbara Hahn from Nottawa, they moved out to Kindersley, um, Saskatchewan and raised their family there. And then the rest of the Hahn family apparently followed them. So there are no Hans in Nottawa any longer. And I think that's it, folks. <laughs> I hope I have a board. Before we stop, I, I would like to say that we have a grandson here. Um, if you'd like to stand up at the back there, Terry, I, I didn't mention you earlier. But Terry Osborne, would you like to stand up? And, and also, if, if Sandra MacArthur would stand up as well. Yes, she's a home And I'd like to thank again Janet and Michael Monahan, if you'd like to stand up. Because without you, this could have happened. Oh, no. You don't like each other? <laughs> okay. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Um, about a year and a half ago, I attended a lecture up at Meaford of the executive director of the British Home Children's Society. And I learned that about 130,000, as I remember, home children came from uh, about the mid-80s until 1939. Yeah. Three of whom, allegedly, according to her, are buried in the cemetery in Owen Sound, allegedly murdered by their families with no repercussions. Um, this, uh, an audience of about 60, uh, most in their 60s, about seven people broke out into tears. Um, they were so upset on behalf of their parents and their grandparents because of what they'd gone through and goodness, we'd seen that here, how they were treated. Interesting enough, the British government and the Australian governments formally apologized on behalf of the governments for how the home children were treated, not only by English society or England not supervising more what were happening to the children over here, but also how uh, Canadians and Australians were treating those kids. Uh, a petition of 80,000 went to the previous Conservative government asking that our government do the same, um, and that government rejected that, unfortunately. Yeah. But you might, uh, if you're interested in this issue, because I was just devastated to see all of these people breaking down into tears as to how their parents and grandparents had been treated. And uh, I signed the, the petition, and I hope that the new government might do the same, same because I mean, well, if we're doing it for residential schools, we should be doing it, in my opinion, for this as well. All right. Um, our, our mayor is the granddaughter of, of a home child here in Collingwood. There, are a lot of, there were a lot of children settled here. And they weren't all sad stories. Um, while I was doing this research for the Staples, I had a, a lady got, I don't know where she was from, with emails, you don't know where they're from. Um, but she was uh, researching, I think, her grandmother, who was a, a British home child, who came over and settled in Duntroon in 1880, which is the same, in 1881, which is the same year that Alfred came up. And um, in the 1891 census, she's listed as a servant. And in the 1901 census, they've changed her name to their surname. They formally adopted her as a child, as their own child, and she's buried with them. Um, so not all stories ended up unhappily. Unfortunately, there were a number that were. The interesting thing that I've been having with this is that I'm having trouble finding things on Canadian home children because they weren't British. They did not come over in the ships. 
Um, so their records are not kept with, let's say, the Bernardo Homes. So right now I'm trying to track down where I'm in touch with the Canadian, um, the, the, the um, Children's Aid Society right now to see if they have, they have some of the infants' records. I'm wondering if they have some of the home child records too. Or whether they combined and whether those records went over to England, even though they were in Canada. Um, because he, he, didn't call, he didn't call his book The Canadian Homeboy for nothing. Because he, was, he didn't come over on the ships as most of the home children did. He, was, he went into the situation in Canada. And there were a lot of them. I started looking through this book, and there were between the, the home, the boy's home, and the girl's home, there were 100, uh, 200 and some children. Then there was a Catholic home that had 481. And this was before the Bernardo started, it was just about the time that the Bernardos were starting to send children over, um, which was around, I think, about 1883. Um, so 1881 was early for it to be happening. Um, but yes, it's certainly something that I think, I don't think should ever be forgotten. I think it's very important that we remember these children. And uh, that's why it was kind of, I, I was thrilled to be able to get this book and know and have a story from our own community, um, which is a diary. It's basically a, well, it's better than a diary because a diary is boring. <laughs> Page by page, today I got up and had breakfast. Um, but but a, it's a memorial, and that is, I think, much more meaningful. And he's made it into a memorial by trying to raise funds to create something special for those children. So, anybody else have any questions or anything? Yes. Do these homes still exist? Do the homes still exist? This. Uh, the, the boys' home in Toronto um, was torn down in, 18, in 1954. And at that point, there was the home that you saw in the picture and two huge wings down the side. And Allen Street School was um, built to um, educate those boys. And this is all located just south of um, Allen Gardens in Toronto. Um, it's now, that house, that um, building was situated where Seton House is today, which is for the homeless. Um, so that, that uh, <laughs> piece of geography certainly has quite a history. Um, yeah, when the boys' home stops, I don't know when they actually stopped it. But of course now they have, you know, yes? I don't know whether this uh, helps the story or the relatives in the back or not, but my cousin Tony Baxeldor, who's now 92, lives in Ilminster, and Ruth and I have visited there about three or four times. Mm -hmm. So the real question is, why did Christopher leave Il Ilminster? Now, I don't know if anybody else has been to Ilminster here, but it's uh, a classic old medieval village in England. The Church of England Church was built in 1000. Yeah. It's a great agrarian area. And listening to the story, uh, when you go there, uh, you know, all the old families had 12, 14 kids. So how do you support large families when everything is very small plots and they are and the farms that are well, still? Yeah. And it's just down the road from Thomas Hardy country in Devon. Mm -hmm. It's also just down the road from a whole slew of stuff. Uh, if you go down the main street, uh, the, the streets are about uh, uh, as wide as two rows here, and we have the great old shops that so you have to duck your head because the doors are only this high because they go back to the year 1000. But when you go into the church, they have a marvelous list of all the ministers that have been in there since the year 1000. Yeah, all, all the little towns and, uh, in It's a fantastic that, area. So. I don't know whether that helps you to add to the story, but that's where they came from. It's a well, classic. Well, I, I think he probably had area. tremendous regrets at having left, and then of course he he left. Well, he he had 130 acres, which was actually pretty good, good. size um, for you know 1870, and he obviously was making a living. He he had he had servants, so that speaks. But I think he thought he, you know, they, they were always promoting Canada as a place to make, you know, great amounts of money, and I think he thought that's what was going to happen. And then, of course, he ended up going back and working as a laborer. 
in the place where he <laughs> grown up in that once. Yes? When did the uh, S, uh, when was that added to the last, last thing? When did Staples became Staples? It just seems to be that all the children call themselves Staples. Owen called them, you know, they all did. So I don't know whether that was, <laughs> maybe that was their um, rebellion against their father. I don't know. But they all added S to their name. But the father, up until that time, and his wife died as a staple. It's interesting, actually, looking up, um, you know, the staples in Kindersley, because I kept getting a store. <laughs> And he says every day he gets orders, he has an apparel store there. And he said every day he gets all these orders in for, for paper and toner and whatever. <laughs> um, the interesting thing too about the home children is that um, they estimate that um, from those 120 to 130,000 children that were brought over to Canada as home children, that, 14, that, that accounts for 14% of our population today in Canada. The descendants. So that's an interesting little tidbit. So, anyway, thank you very much for being so patient. I don't know if anyone has ever read this book. If you're interested in home children, there's a small book called The Little Immigrants. The author escapes me at the moment, but it's just a very small book that I bought many years ago for my mother in, um, in Saunders. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's very interesting reading and it tells a lot of the stories again the good stories and the bad stories and there was a, a movie made by CBC some maybe 30 years ago and I, the only um, actor I can remember that was in it was R.H. Thompson and it depicted um, this, this, the plight of the home children as well so it was very interesting oh and I have a copy in the library it's red, it's not blue that you can actually sign out once I've cataloged it, try and get to that first thing in the morning. <laughs> so if anybody would actually like to come into the, into the library and actually borrow the book, I'm making it available for interlibrary loan because I want people to read the story. I think it's worthwhile. So, there we go, folks. <laughs>